The member for Pascoe Vale. Thank you, Acting Speaker, and I, um, I'm honoured to follow in the footsteps of the member for Narakan's very heartfelt contribution, which I commend him for. I rise to support the Crimes Amendment Non-Fatal Strangulation Bill of 2023. And doing so, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are currently in the midst of commemorating this global 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. And I commend the work of the Minister for Family Violence Prevention and of Respect Victoria and all the other organisations, um, but particularly Respect Victoria, who were just in Parliament actually last sitting week. And I'll touch on a bit shortly. Acting Speaker, everyone should have the right to feel safe in our communities and in our homes. Sadly, however, this is not the case for many Victorians, particularly for women and children. This is because despite the best efforts of federal, state, local and non-government organisations to date, gender-based violence and family violence still sadly remains one of the most common law and order issues across the country and the state. Speaker, sadly, according to our watch, on average one woman a week is murdered by a current or former partner. And on average 15 women a day are hospitalised due to domestic violence. Just think about that. Acting Speaker, according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, Personal Safety Australia report, which was released in March of 23 this year, across Australia, an estimated 8 million Australians, 41%, have experienced violence, physical or sexual abuse since the age of 15, including two in five women who have experienced violence, 39% or 3.9 million women. One in five women have experienced sexual violence, that's 22% of women in Australia. One in three women have also experienced physical violence, 31%. One in five women have experienced stalking, 20%. It's over two million women. Across Australia, the prevalence of intimate partner and family member violence experienced since the age of 15 continues to remain alarmingly high. One in four women experienced violence by an intimate partner or family member, 27% of the population, women, female population. One in 12 women experienced violence by a family member. One in four women have experienced violence by an intimate partner. That's 2.3 million women. One in 11, 11 women experience violence by a boyfriend, girlfriend or a date, 9.3%, 920,000 women. One in six women have experienced um, uh, violence by a cohabiting partner, around 17%. One in four women have experienced cohabiting partner emotional abuse, 23% of women. One in six women have experienced cohabiting partner economic abuse, around 16%. And almost 13% of women have experienced some form of sexual harassment. When it comes to children acting speaker, according to the ABS, an estimated 2.7 million Australians aged over 18 years and over, 14% have experienced some form of abuse, physical or sexual, by an adult before the age of 15. Of women, 18% or 1.1 million women have reported experiencing sexual abuse during childhood. And 10% or 988,000 women have reported experiencing physical abuse during their childhood. Acting Speaker, in my municipality of Marybeck for the year ending 2022, we recorded 1,996 family violence incidents and thus far in 2023, we've recorded 1,987 incidents. These statistics all combined are truly stark and behind each statistic is a mother, a sister, a son or a daughter. And as parliamentarians in this place, we all have a role and a responsibility to do everything we can to end gender-based and family violence, especially amongst male parliamentarians, to send the message that it's not acceptable, it's not on. And that is why the Victorian Labor government established the landmark Royal Commission into Family Violence in 2016, the first of its kind in the nation, which went on to reveal many failures and areas of reform across our system that needed improving. The Royal Commission on page 18 sadly found that the following main trends that emerged and that are consistent with much of that data that I just referenced, and I quote, family violence disproportionately affects women and children. The majority of perpetrators are men. Female victims are more likely to be a current or former part, partner of the perpetrator. Some groups are greater at risk of family violence and experience it at increased rates. This includes Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and women with disabilities. These and other groups face particular barriers in seeking and obtaining help. They include people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, people living in rural, regional and remote areas. And although it is not clear whether the prevalence of family violence, that is the proportion of the population who have experienced such violence at least once, is increasing, we do know that there has been greater reporting of family violence leading to an increase in incidents being recognised. In Victoria, this has been evident in the increased number of reports to police and the number of family violence intervention orders that are being issued. Acting Speaker, the Victorian Labor Government announced implementation of the final recommendations of the Royal Commission on the 28th of January of this year, meeting our commitment to implement all of the 227 recommendations put forward by the Commission. 
The Commission included 25 days of extensive public hearing, hearings and community conversations with over 800 Victorians and nearly 1,000 written submissions being received, with the Commission's 227 recommendations very much continuing to be the foundations of our work in this space. The Commission's recommendations collectively sought to find ways to better align and coordinate government and community services to address and prevent family violence, improve support for victim support and hold perpetrators to account. And in this respect, Acting Speaker, I draw the House's attention to page 32 of the Family Violence Royal Commission report, which has helped inform the necessity of this bill and which uh, stated and found that, quote, family violence related deaths are the ultimate tragedy of family violence. They are not uncommon and an intimate partner homicide is the most common form, sadly. The Royal Commission identified that the Victorian systemic review of family violence deaths as a valuable way of reducing the risk of further deaths, which they suggested be statutorily established and with funding provided that is sustained and adequate to ensure that the coroner's court can continue to expand the review if required. Building on the work of the Commission, the Victorian Labor Government's Gender Equality Strategy Action Plan 23 to 27, which was recently released, seeks to help us continue building the foundations for a more equal and safer state for all Victorians. Action number 80 in this strategy commits the government to, and I quote, explore options to introduce a standalone non-fatal strangulation offence to address this serious and insidious form of offending that occurs particularly in the context of family violence. Acting Speaker, this bill seeks to progress this recommendation through the introduction of two new indictable offences of intentional non-fatal strangulation against a family member in the Crimes Act of 1958. Standalone offences are needed to support the identification and prosecution of non-fatal strangulation, which often occurs within the context of family violence and is a predictive risk factor for future harm or even death. The bill will introduce two new offences of non-fatal strangulation in the Crimes Act. An offence of intentional non-fatal strangulation against a family member, as defined in the Family Violence Protection Act of 2008, with a maximum penalty of five years imprisonment. An offence also of intentional non-fatal strangulation against a family member which intentionally causes injury which has a maximum penalty of 10 years imprisonment. The bill will also make consequential amendments to the Family Violence Act to ensure that non-fatal strangulation is recognised as an act of family violence for the purposes of family violence intervention orders, consideration of bail applications and protections for witness giving evidence. The offences will prohibit choking, strangling and or suffocating, which will be defined non-exhaustively as applying pressure to the front or the sides of a neck, obstructing or interfering with a person's respiratory system and impeding re respiration. Some Australian jurisdictions, including Queensland, South Australia and the ACT, have standalone offences and have seen courts narrowly interpret the term choke, strangle or suffocate where these terms are not clearly defined. These narrow interpretations have imposed in, inappropriately high evidentiary burdens on the prosecution and may serve to further traumatise victim survivors. The broad definition used in this bill aims to avoid this issue. The offences in this bill, therefore, will enhance the protection of victim survivors, particularly victim survivors of family violence, more effectively hold offenders to account, provide clearer indication to police and community service practitioners of escalating family uh, violent situations and further raise awareness of the dangers and potential lethality of non-fatal strangulation among police, courts and community service practitioners and drive more effective medical, legal and law enforcement responses. <coughs> non-fatal strangulation is a highly dangerous and potentially life-threatening offence that should have no place in our community. This conduct is already captured by criminal offences such as common assault, intentionally or recklessly causing injury or assault and with intent to commit a sexual offence. Um, with the time I have remaining acting speaker, I'd like to draw the House's attention to some of the work of our local organisations who do work in this important space. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge and commend the work of Victoria Police locally who are based out of Brunswick and Faulkner Police Stations who deal with these issues every single day. I thank them and all emergency service personnel for their services. I'd like to also just acknowledge all of the social workers who work across our health, wellbeing and community sectors. They do an amazing job and they deal really with the fallout of a lot of these issues on a daily basis. Members of the ASU, HACSU and so many other unions. Our social workers, my wife used to be one for many years actually in this space. They do a tremendous job and we really owe them a massive debt of gratitude just like we do our nurses and doctors in the health sector. I have so many organisations like that I'd like to talk about, but I'll just quickly run through. Mary Community Health, Vincent Care has a, a hub in, Gl in Glenroy in Wheatshift Road, Youth Projects as well in Glenroy, Youth Activating Youth in Brunswick, the Oxygen Youth Hub in Gaffney Street, Coburg, the Ethnic Communities Council in Victoria, Women's Health in the North, Respectful Relationships in our schools programs that we run, and of course the Orange Door Services. One organisation I'd particularly like to highlight though is Vic Seg New Futures. 
which was first established in uh, 1981 and particularly focused on supporting migrant uh, communities and migrant families. I recently had the pleasure to visit there to announce $88,000 to support their Family Violence Prevention Initiatives Acting Speaker and to meet with the workers and the educators. They've been doing landmark work and really leading the way for so many years in this space amongst culturally, linguistically diverse communities. I commend the bill to the House. Thank you.